Hi, my name is Matthew Wilson, and this is part two of a mini series going through the different views on the millennium. In the first video, I discussed how people have understood the genres of Revelation, the different interpretive approaches to Revelation, and I gave a quick introduction to the views on the, uh, of the millennium. We learned how one understands the genre of Revelation has a direct effect on the interpretive approach one takes to the book as a whole. We also learned that premillennialists, they argue that Christ will come again before a literal and physical millennial kingdom in which Christ reigns. In other words, Christ's second coming will occur before the millennium. That's why it's called premillennialism. Postmillennialists argue that Christ will return after the millennium. That's why it's called postmillennialism. We remember, or we must remember, that a postmillennialist understanding of the millennium is not a 1,000 year period where Christ reigns on earth. Instead, they argue that the millennium is really the present church age where Christ is reigning through the guaranteed and gradual success of the gospel and converting the nations. After a certain amount of success, Christ returns. That level of success is disagreed upon or unknown at the very least. Uh, lastly, uh, millennialists believe that there will not be a future millennial kingdom and that the present church age represents the intermediate kingdom. The primary difference between amillennialism and postmillennialism is that uh, amillennialists see much or expect much less success in converting the nations. The world will not necessarily improve in their opinion, but when Christ returns, he will deliver the church from the pressures and persecutions that are occurring. So in this specific video, uh, we're going to look at the correct position, the premillennialist view. I'm, I'm half kidding about this, but uh, this is the view that New Hope Community Church holds to. And at this point in time, I personally lean extremely heavily towards it. But uh, so many of my favorite teachers hold the different positions on this topic. So I'm like reserved in, in holding to this, to this view, though I, I do strongly lean towards it. Others who might not know uh, or others who hold to this position are John MacArthur, John Piper, Justin Peters, Stephen Lawson, Wayne Grudem, among many others. Uh, but in any case, the structure of this video is going to be, uh, I'll present what I think to be the three strongest arguments for premillennialism. After each argument, I'm going to give you uh, the responses from the other positions, that is postmillennialism and amillennialism. Um, millennialism. I'm not going to go into depth on those responses because in the videos on those individual views, I'll go deep into how they understand uh, the millennium. If you missed the first video, it might be a good idea to go back and view it because there are some terms that I'm going to throw around and I'm not going to explain them in this video just to save time. I might like say a word or two about them to remind you, but I'm not going to explain them as well as I did in the first video. I also, I want to remind you that my goal in this series is not to, to explain absolutely everything about each, each position, but I want to give you the main arguments for those positions. There's a lot more that I could say, but I don't have the time and I, I don't know everything either. But with that said, uh, let's get into it. The first argument for the premillennialist position that I want to look at is the chronological sequence of Revelation 19 to 20. Premillennialists will argue that there is a chronological sequence between chapters 19 and 20, which leads necessarily leads to the con conclusion that the binding of Satan, the reigning of the believers, is after the future coming of Christ. So in chapter 19, we see that Christ returns. Uh, we see the Battle of Armageddon there. And in chapter 20, we have the millennial reign of Christ. If these two chapters are read chronologically, then it simply means that the return of Christ occurs before the millennium. That's really straightforward. Craig Blazing, in his book, the it's actually it's not his book, but he partakes in it. The book is The Views on the Millennium and Beyond. Uh, where 
there are three different views that are presented on the millennium. They're the ones that we're going that we're looking at right now. But in in that book, in his section, he offers some solid reasoning as to why it's chronological between chapters 19 and 20 instead of being an example of recapitulation. One example is that, or one reason is that, quote, there is no structural indication of a major break within the sequence recapitulating pre-Perusia conditions, end quote. So recapitulation, I mentioned this in the other, view, other video, but it's basically the repeating of a scene that's already been described earlier in the book that's how we can understand, at least in, the, in this context. And Perusia, it refers to the second coming of Christ. So what he's saying here is that there's no structural marker in the text that suggests that there's a major break in the sequence from one section to another that would suggest recapitulation taking place in this specific text or in this specific section. So to support this, he argues that the phrase Kai Adon, which is just, and I saw, and I saw. Uh, and this is the structural marker in this series. He argues that it does not signify a structural break because this would be contrary to his use throughout the entire group of visions. So to use this phrase for a break in the sequence would be odd grammatically. We see the phrase, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw. We see it in 1911, 1917, 1919, 21, and 24, 20 verse 4. Uh, John says, he's saying, I, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw. And basically what he's arguing is that for this phrase to function in a way that signifies a break in chronological sequence here would be odd. If he wanted to show, that is, John wanted to show that there was some sort of shift in the sequence of what's happening he could have used another phrase or some sort of other marker to make that clear but he keeps using the same phrase and i saw and i saw and i saw and the premillennials will argue that this is simply chronological another point is that the description of satan's relation to the world and chapter 20 verses 1 to 3 is incompatible with the descriptions of the relationship envisioned by John as transpiring prior to the coming second coming he supports this by quoting that is blazing he supports this by quoting Alan Johnson who essentially says that the details of what's happening in Revelation 20 they're too different in too many ways to be an example of recapitulation of, of an event described earlier on in Revelation an example of the differences is the contrast between Satan's activity in chapters 12 to 13 and his inactivity in chapter 20. You can look into that for yourself. I'm not going to, I don't have time to dig into that, but I would compare and contrast how Satan is active in chapters 12 and 13 and how he's inactive in chapter 20. Another reason why he sees a difference in the activity that's in, uh, is that in Revelation 9, there are locusts who are allowed out of the pit, which is the abyss, and only when they're released from the pit is their influence felt. Uh, and in chapter 20, Satan, when Satan is thrown into the abyss, he's locked in. Uh, basically, what this would mean if we're interpreting symbols consistently throughout the book, that when Satan's thrown in, his influence wouldn't be felt anymore just as the influence of the the locust was not felt when they were locked in the abyss or the pit. They were only felt or their influence was only felt when they were allowed out. I think together this makes a strong case for the sequential understanding of Revelation 19 to 20, which necessarily leads to the reading that the second coming of Christ occurs before the millennium. So to briefly repeat this this section, um, by saying that there is no sign of structural break between chapters 19 and 20, and by saying that the details of Satan Satan's activity described in chapter 20 compared to how he's described earlier in the book, it gives good reason to think that chapters 19 to 20 should be understood in a sequential manner. I think at the very least, we do not see a need for them to not be read in a chronological manner. And if this is true, then, as I keep saying, Christ returns before the millennium and premillennialism is proven in some way.
Now, obviously, amillennialists and postmillennialists would disagree with this reading, uh, or reading Revelation as a whole in the fu- in a futuristic, chronological, and literal manner, which necessarily basically leads to reading Revelation nineteen to twenty in a chronological way, also or a sequential way. Uh, instead, uh, postmillennialists, they're preterists or historicists, and I think sometimes idealists. And many amillennials are primarily idealists in their approach to Revelation. Both camps, they tend to interpret Revelation more symbolically. They would see Revelation as cyclic rather than chronological, and this leads them to understand Revelation simply as recapitulation of an event that is described that has already been described in Revelation. The details of this disagreement, I'll, I'll flesh out more in the amillennial section, um, but it is important to know that they simply will not read Revelation 19 and 20 in a sequential manner. And it, it makes sense once you look at their views. In any case, I do want to mention here that the phrase, and I saw in the amillennialist and postmillennialist understanding would not be seen as a sequential and next I saw her and then I saw. Also, as for the differences in the description of Satan in chapter 20 compared to the rest of the book, they would agree that Satan has been bound, but the difference in their views would be the extent to which that has an effect on the way that he influences the world today. They would say that Satan still does some have some sort of influence, though he is bound, but his influence is only bound to the extent that he is not able to deceive the nations any longer. And that would be in the, uh, I think specifically in the, uh, in the success of the gospel as it is preached to the nations. So that's argument number one. Argument number two is the two physical resurrections that are mentioned in Revelation 20. Uh, We find this specifically in uh, chapter 20, verses 4 to 6, where two resurrections are mentioned. I think we should look at this passage, so I'm going to read these verses. In verse 4, John writes, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge, and I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their heads or their hands. Sorry. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them and they will not be priests of God and of Christ and will reign Oh, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So you'll notice in this passage, we see the phrase, they came to life. It's mentioned twice. First, it's in reference to those who reign with Christ. And second, it's in reference to those who come to life after the 1,000 year period. The first coming to life is referenced as a first resurrection clearly in the text. That's a clear reference to it. The first coming to life is the first resurrection. Premillennialists argue that because the same verb verb for uh, they came to life, which is ezason, um, it's used in reference to both resurrections. So if it's used in reference to both resurrections, those resurrections must be of the same type. The same type. So it's commonly understood that the second resurrection is clearly a bodily resurrection. I'm pretty sure that all the approaches would agree with that. The second resurrection that's mentioned is a bodily resurrection. But not all agree that the first resurrection is bodily. A premillennialist, so not all agree that the first one's bodily, they'll say the first one is spiritual. But a premillennialist would argue that the former resurrection must be bodily also if the second one is, which leads to the necessary conclusion that both be future and both are showing a future uh, thousand year period between the resurrections. I think there's a strong point and George Ladd, he sums up this point well when he says that, quote, we have lost control of exegesis 
if we claim that the same word can have two different meanings in the same context without any contextual warrant. So if one resurrection is clearly physical, we better have good contextual warrant to say that the other resurrection is also or is spiritual. That is not physical. But I don't think that we see that there. And premillennialists will argue we don't see that there. There is not good contextual warrant. To back this up, um, I brought this up in the first video, but Tom Schreiner, he he leans towards amillennialism and he loosely quotes N.T. Wright, who says that the word for resurrection, which is anastasis, always refers to a physical resurrection in the New Testament, except for possibly in this case. So if this word for resurrection always means physical resurrection in the New Testament, except for in this case, there better be good contextual warrant to define the word in a spiritual manner, which I don't think appears to be the case, but these other groups will argue that. Additionally, uh, it appears that those who participate in the first resurrection, they are not involved in the second, resurre second resurrection, meaning that there are two separate resurrections. So this is very clear, I think, from the phrase, the rest of the dead uh, who do not come to life, the rest not included in the in the first resurrection, the rest, the others, you could say, no, that's not the word. Those who come to life until the thousand of the years, until the thousand years are completed. From this, I think it's clear that they are, are two separate resurrections. It's important to note here uh, that the reason why premillennialists will understand the two resurrections would be physical is because of their hermeneutical, hermeneutical approach to the passage and in general revelation, they, they approach it in a futuristic, chronological, and literal way. But one could be a, a premillennialist with a combined approach. approach. Um, also, they, they, take, they, they have respect for the symbolic nature, premillennialists will, but their procedure is to assume a literal interpretation of each symbolic representation provided uh, to John unless a particular factor in the text indicates that it should be interpreted figuratively. If one approaches Revelation 24 to 6 in that way, it's basically exegetically absurd to conclude that the two resurrections are not of the same kind. So, in order to say that they aren't of the same kind, you have to approach the book in a very different way, specifically that passage in a different way. Amillennialists and postmillennialists, in response to this, they're going to argue that the first re re resurrection in Revelation 20 is spiritual. This is based on biblical passages that are similar to John 5, 28 to 29, in that they indicate that Jesus' statement is contrary to leaving room for two bodily resurrections separated by a period of time. I think we should look at this passage. In uh, verse 28, Jesus says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done evil or those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned, condemned, end quote. You'll notice that all will come out, that the all will come out. Uh, there doesn't seem to be room or a suggestion that there is an intermediate period between two physical resurrections. Jesus seems to be saying that, all of this is going to happen at once. Those who rise to life and those who rise to be condemned. Uh, they would argue that the, the clear text, I think both groups would argue this, but that the clear text of the New Testament ought to inform how we understand Revelation 20, which is unclear on the matter in their understanding. So they would argue that Revelation 20 is unclear due to the apocalyptic and highly symbolic nature of, of the book in general. So the interpretive principle that they kind of go by is the clear ought to help us to interpret the unclear and rather than the 
rather than interpreting the clear passages by the unclear. And in their view, the unclear would be Revelation 20, and the clear would be the text in the New Testament that point to a an impossibility, basically, of leaving room open for two physical resurrections happening at different periods of time. The third argument that I want to look at for the premillennialist position is the Old Testament and New Testament suggestion of a millennial period. I think it's important to look at how the whole Bible looks at or leaves room open for a millennial period. Not just like a lot of people would claim that premillennialists are just premillennials because of Revelation 20, which I think there's a lot of truth to that. If Revelation 20 was not in the Bible, I would. I don't know if I would be a premillennialist. Uh, but at the same time, that's not to say that there isn't suggestion of a pre or a millennial period uh, throughout the Bible. What I mean by this argument is that in the millennium, things are going to be different. So, for example, if Satan's been bound and Christ is reigning on the earth with believers and the Battle of Armageddon has just occurred and all the unbelievers have been wiped out, at least that's how I understand it, uh, then times are going to be different. Sin and death is or will still be present, but the people in the millennium, at least in the beginning of the tribulation, or uh, at least in the beginning, that they will all be believers. Those who have been resurrected and those who survive through the tribulation will be present. Uh, I want to show that not only does Revelation show that this is a period in time, but that the Old Testament and New Testament also show that this is a period in time. Also, very briefly, many believe that the, the promises made to, made to Israel and the Old Testament, say like the land promises, um, will be fulfilled in this millennial period. And that's an important point to, to understand. Promises made to Israel will be fulfilled. All the ones that have not been fulfilled will be fulfilled here. So let's start with the Old Testament passages. I'm probably not going to read every passage, but I will look at some of them. In Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, he proposes that, quote, several Old Testament passages seem to fit neither in the present age nor in the eternal state, end quote. So they appear to indicate some future stage in the history of redemption, which is better, greater than the present church age, but still doesn't see sin being gone and rebellion being gone and death being gone like we were still seeing sin rebellion and death um so basically what he's saying is that uh, there's a period in time that's suggested by the old testament and the new testament that doesn't fit what we're seeing today and it doesn't fit the eternal state but it fits this kind of in-between period where things are better than what's going on today, but things aren't as good as the eternal state. And this is how, and premillennials will fit these passages into the millennium. In Isaiah 65, 20, he indicates that babies and old men won't die prematurely, but death and sin will still be present. In a premillennialist understanding, this passage fits right in with the millennial age where death is still present, but there is a shift in premature deaths. So things are different. They aren't perfect, but they aren't as bad as they are now. So this is intermediate age, basically, that Isaiah is pointing to. In Isaiah 11, 6 to 11, uh, Grudem, he also brings up this text. He says that Isaiah seems to predict that there will be people who are seeking the Messiah and coming to salvation, and God is still gathering the remnant of his people, but at the same time there will be a renewal of, of nature that is not occurring in this present age. So we see in this passage that there's a sharp change in nature where animals that would still be hostile towards each other, are th that are still host hostile towards each other like in our day, are, are now living in harmony. Uh, and at this time, the same time that these animals are living in harmony that shouldn't be living or that aren't living in harmony in our day, there's a remnant that's being saved and there are still nations that are coming to Christ. So it, it cannot be explaining the eternal state, uh, but 
it's also at the same time not like our day. We're not seeing this. So Grudem thinks that this indicates a future millennial kingdom. I, I do too. I think it leaves significant room or it, it suggests it at the very least that it leaves room open for that millennial period. Another example is Psalm 72, 8 to 14, where a messianic ruler is described that is, quote, far more extensive than that experienced by David or Solomon, end quote. But there's still violence and oppression, which points to an age that's it's different from the present age, but it falls short of the eternal age where there's no more sin, no more suffering. So this in-between age, it fits well with the millennium again. And in Zechariah 14, 5 to 17, uh, we see that there's a description that, again, it does not fit the present age because the Lord, he's king over all the earth. But it also does not fit the eternal state either because of the disobedience and rebellion against the Lord that's clearly present. So the Lord is reigning over all the earth, but there's still disobedience. There's still rebellion. Uh, and that's another example of this intermediate state, or could be at least. New Testament examples, there, I'm going to go through, I think, three of them. Yeah, I'll do three New Testament examples. Uh, you can find more. Uh, the first is Revelation 2, 26 to 27, where uh, it says that believers who conquer over evil will rule over rebellious people. Uh, Grudem, he suggests here that this fits well with a future millennial kingdom, but it does not feel well, fit well with any time in the present age or in the eternal state. Because if there's a rebellious people, it's not the eternal state. If it's today, believers are not ruling over them. Uh, they aren't conquering over evil. Um, so... It's basically another example of this in-between age. And I know that this is in Revelation and, and amillennialists and postmillennialists approach the book in a different way, but I just wanted to mention it. Another example is in 1 Corinthians 15, 23 to 25. Uh, we see two adverbs. Uh, one is eta and then the other one is apeta. And both of these words mean then. So then and then. And they both indicate being next in the order of time. At least they can indicate that. And I think in this context they do. Some would argue that the words here simply mean then as in like at, at that time. But I think that the argument for the temporal sequence is stronger. Uh, this passage, it shows that there is an interval of time between Christ's resurrection and his second coming when we receive a resurrection body. So there's this interval of time between Christ's second coming and the, and the end, when Christ delivers the kingdom over to God after having reigned for a time and put all of his enemies under his feet. So I, I think we should actually look at this passage because it's, it's a little confusing if we don't look at it. Uh, so starting in verse 23, but each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then, so we see the word then, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then, again, the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all the enemies on, all his enemies under his feet. The words then in this passage, as I said before, indicate a passage of time. Christ was the first one who was resurrected. We're speaking about resurrection. Then, when he returns at a later time, those who belong to him will be resurrected. Then the end will come at a later time. So it, this simply suggests that there's an interval of time between Christ's second coming and the end. And that interval of time could be a reference to the millennium. My favorite one is Acts 1, 6 to 8. Uh, and we can look at more, but let's just look at these couple because I don't want to get lost in the weeds too much. Lastly, in, in Acts 1, 6 to 8, uh, there's a strong indication that after Jesus' resurrection, his disciples were still expecting an earthly kingdom to be established. And in response to this expectation, 
uh, Jesus, he doesn't correct their interpretation or their understanding of, expe of expecting an earthly kingdom, but he says that he can't tell them when this is going to happen. I want to look at this one too. In verse 6, Acts chapter 1, uh, we read, Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So I want you to notice here that the disciples ask, when are you going to restore the kingdom? That is, an earthly kingdom. Jesus doesn't say, why are you expecting an earthly kingdom? The kingdom that you will possess is spiritual. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say you've misunderstood Old Testament prophecies. You're missing the point. This is spiritual. This is a spiritual. He doesn't say that. No, he simply says he can't tell them when this is going to happen, which strongly implies that it's going to happen. And the millennium would be this period of fulfillment. So I think that this evidence from the Old Testament and New Testament shows that there is room or is a place for the millennium period or Millennium Kingdom outside of Revelation 20. Uh, I strongly encourage you to go and look at each of the passages, interpret them in context, see how they fit with the whole Bible. It's basically what I'm trying to do here uh, in a very quick way, but uh, it's something that you need to look into on your own. Uh, I need to mention also that this flows from, specifically with Old Testament and New, New Testament, it flows from a more literal understanding of Old Testament prophecies Premillennialists they'll generally take Old Testament prophecies that have not been fulfilled literally, still needing to be fulfilled, though they would allow for partial fulfillment in, in certain spiritual ways, but only if it's really explicitly or very strongly implied in the New Testament. Uh, that's, that's just important to know. They also generally will make, I don't know if always, but I think it's always, they'll make a distinct distinction between the church and Israel. So the promises that are made to Israel in the Old Testament still need to be fulfilled uh, as being given to Israel. Those promises made to Israel cannot be fulfilled in the church as an odd millennialist or post-millennialist might understand. Uh, the church is not present until the New Testament begins. There is no church in the Old Testament. Though that's a very different understanding than odd millennialists and post-millennialists. That's just important to note here. Uh, it's a whole framework of understanding Old Testament prophecies, New Testament fulfillment, uh, literal fulfillment, spiritual fulfillment. It's very, very different. This is why I said before that I think that it's wise to go to a church that, and that, that you agree with because it's going to affect those things. And that's a lot of the Bible. That's a lot of the Bible. That's a very distinct difference in understanding Old Testament and New Testament so anyways, amillennialists and postmillennialists, post they're going to uh, respond to this, um, that the Old Testament, when properly understood, it doesn't leave room for a millennial period, at least in the way that a premillennialist understands it. Amillennialists, specifically, they're going to see many of the prophecy, prophecies that have not already been fulfilled typologically or spiritually. That's generally how they're going to understand uh, prophecies given to Israel, they understand them typologically or spiritually fulfilled in the church. They're going to say whichever ones haven't been fulfilled will be fulfilled in the new heavens and the new earth rather than in the millennial kingdom. I'll discuss that more in the, when I do the millenn millennial uh, video. But they would also argue that the New Testament rules out the possibility of a millennial kingdom following Christ's return. And I'll also discuss that in detail on the amillennialist uh, video. Postmillennialists would argue that the Old Testament does not, or it does leave room, sorry, it does leave room for a millennial period, but that period is now. In Isaiah 65, Strimple, this is a postmillennialist, he'll su he suggests that, quote, the new heavens and the new earth that Isaiah has in mind are present realities consequent upon the first advent of Christ, end quote. So this is because of the presence of sin and death. Uh, when it comes to the New Testament postmillennialists, they would argue that the texts mentioned are proper are improperly understood. 
Christians, deceased and alive, are both presently ruling with Christ. This is, I'll explain that more in the post millennialist section below, or in the post millennialist section, like the video that I'll I'll do later on. So that's what I've got uh, for premillennialism. I hope that this is helpful to present some of the stronger arguments for this position and to br briefly show you how other groups would respond or kind of understand those those issues, though I, I will go much more in depth in their own videos. It's too much to do right now. Uh, I encourage you to listen to the ones that will follow because it'll kind of help you understand. It's not just going to help you understand, you know, how people approach the millennium, but it's going to help you understand like why people are so different in their understanding of of different passages in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Like, especially if you're from a predominantly premillennialist background, it'll help you understand why people are interpreting a passage so differently than what you've ever heard before. It, it, it's basically an entire framework. And those videos, I'll basically do the same thing that I do in this one to help you get a better understanding of the premillennialist position and the other ones. Uh, I personally, I believe that premillennialism has the strongest arguments, but I also tend to lean towards a literal uh, interpretation of the Bible when when I can. Um, but and not everyone follows that, and they have good reasons to do so. Uh, and when I present the other positions, I'm going to do my best to give you those those arguments from their mouths, like the, the mouths of those who hold the position rather than mine, because uh, basically just to avoid bias. Um, in any case, thanks for listening to this video. Uh, I'll do videos on the other positions probably within the coming weeks. Thank you.